Awesome. Hello, divine, beautiful souls. This is Energy Speaks Podcast with your host, Katriel. Today, we have a very special guest here today, and it is Rabbi Daniel Silverstein from Jerusalem. How are you today? I am really well. Thanks, Katriel. It's great to be with you. Great to be with you as well. Um, so for the viewers or listeners more so, <laughs> um, Rabbi Daniel, um, has, uh, been teaching at the conservative yeshiva here in Jerusalem, um, and does so much more as well. Um, but this is where I met him and, um, I began with Hasidut and it's been an incredible journey just, you know, um, learning with you and you have so much wisdom and I just thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure. You know, when you invited me, I was, uh, you know, somewhat flattered and also it's a nice chance for us to have a conversation. I've always enjoyed our interactions, always learned a lot from you as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to chat. Cool. Yo. So, um, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, why did you want to become a rabbi? Um, so in my 20s, I was, uh, okay, the best way to tell the story is like this. Um, okay. I be I, my family weren't religious. I became religious roughly uh, at the age of 10. And then between, so between the ages like of like 10 and 20, I was religiously observant. I was kind of modern orthodox. Um, mostly uh, with some uh, anomalies. Um, and then when I was about 20 at college, I stopped religious practice altogether. I, I just overnight, I mean, it was a, that was a gradual process to get there, but I went from like praying three times a day and eating only strictly kosher food and keeping the Sabbath, Shabbat strictly and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just went from that to zero observance uh, i was still very proud to be jewish and very zionist and very like connected to a kind of like jewish ancient tribal identity and language but i was actually quite angry at judaism uh, i regarded judaism as basically uh, a bunch of rules that had been keeping me confined and I, I was like really like in the spirit of rebelling against it um and so i searched for meaning everywhere except judaism for a few years and after a few years i kind of like began to notice that i was only really resonating with things that reminded me of things from judaism and just kind of begrudgingly uh accepted that i wasn't really finding anything that resonated as deeply with me anywhere else mm -hmm. so i kind of felt called back um and i i felt the call to reconnect with torah and reconnect with prayer reconnect with shabbat and um slowly but surely i did that uh this time like in a much more intentional way uh much more kind of really by choice uh first you know that was really how i viewed it like i was really like picking and choosing what i wanted to do and how i wanted to do it um as i say at first um and it never it never would have dawned on me in a million years that I was going to become a rabbi or that I was going to end up being fairly traditional in my observance. Cause I, I was, I still really wasn't into that kind of thing. <clears throat> but basically I found myself doing a lot of the things that rabbis do. Uh, I was an informal educator. I was a musician and part of like everything. I was like my art and my edu informal education was like Jewish content. And I was doing interfaith work and being like an ambassador for Judaism and, just, and I was like, then I was, found myself in the Moisha house, the Jewish communal house, running events. And, um, you know, if I say found myself, I, I, you know, I felt drawn to these spaces and to this kind of activity. Um, and basically, I was doing a lot of stuff the rabbis do, as I said. But I wasn't actually, like, I was, I was hitting the limits of my own knowledge and my own abilities. Like, I was realizing, like, I could be doing so much better if I actually, like, studied. <laughs> Because <laughs> the Judaism, because <laughs> uh, I just didn't know very much at this point. I had, you know, it had been a long time at this point since I seriously studied Judaism, and I'd forgotten a lot of what I did used to know. Um, so I started scheming on uh, taking some time to study Judaism, 
Um, and I'm, I'm, my vision at first was just like to do that for a year or two. And, uh, and I, I went to Jerusalem to do that. And I, I was at a poetry slam performing a rap. And I, I met this guy um, who said that he asked me if I'd ever thought about being a rabbi. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, like you just heard <laughs> me do, do, a, do a rap, you know, like what, what, you know, what's going on? Yeah. And, he, and then, and then he said, oh, you have the right aura. And I was like, wait a minute. Like, I've never heard the word rabbi and the word aura in the same sentence before. Like, <laughs> so I, I, mean, I was like beginning to listen to this guy, like with fresh ears, like who is he and what's he talking about? And he was telling me about a cool yeshiva that I ended up going to in New York for four years. Um, wow. Yeshiva Chavarito or YCT. And, um, you know, it turned out to be a great decision. I, 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 had, I had really set my heart on being in Israel at the time. So I was surprised to find myself leaving Israel um but that's that's what happened and um so i you know just like i part of the decision which is what you asked about was like um i realized that being a rabbi would just enable me to carry on doing all the same things that i was doing already just much better that is basically it i love that wow you know i can um relate um when back in florida um I started a group called Chevet Kalot with some friends, mm -hmm. um, Tribe of Voices. And it happened to be actually like right around Purim time and right before COVID started is when we really started to like um, connect. And then we found ourselves in the middle of COVID with like a bunch of friends that actually cared about our Jewish identity. And we, we wanted to do something with it. And so I became kind of like this leader. And then I got, I, I started to hit my limits because, you know, when we would need to lead certain things, um, I could only do it from a certain perspective. I couldn't do it from like, you know, uh, like an Orthodox or even a conservative perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, it was more like renewal style, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, totally. And and it was just like it was it was a huge thing. Like I was like, okay, well, I need to to learn. <laughs> like this is a thing. <laughs> and I actually found my myself um, uh, seeing a ad or something for Romemu Yeshiva. Mm-hmm. And um, I went to their um, Shavuot three-day, like, um, silent retreat thing that was online. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> like, how are we going to do this? And it was so impactful. Like, mm. I, I, like, it, it taught me so much. Like, one, how to listen how to quiet the mind and also mm. allow myself to receive. Mm. And it shifted a lot to where I was like, we're going to Israel soon. Like that's, what's just going to happen. <laughs> wow. And, um, after that, I did a semester, um, you know, with a couple classes. class, it was uh, a class on Imuna mm -hmm. and, uh, another class, um, with Nigunim and, as I was reading through your bio, um, like last year, I realized that you had a connection with Romemu. Right. Yeah, I was uh, I was on that faculty the first three years of the yeshiva. It was great. I I, I wasn't at that Shavuot thing you're talking about though. I don't know why, but um, yeah. I guess I was guess I was busy or something. But um, yeah, I mean it was it was everything I was at. With them was was wonderful and uh it was it was a very special experiment um we were part of and i don't I, nobody knows i think right now what's going on with the program but uh you know hopefully it will continue in some form in some way because i think i think as you say it was very impactful yeah is is yeah it was is very impactful and i see i didn't even know i thought they were still operating you know once uh, I don't. I honestly don't know. Is the truth? I haven't been in the loop, so it, it's possible yeah. they even are. Wow, but yeah, like 
that's it's 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 wild you know the how how we're all so connected um even you know when we're halfway across the world from each other have completely different backgrounds and and then we end up you know at the same yeshiva you know like it's it's just right. absolutely incredible totally oh, yeah wow. the uh the journeys uh intersect when that when and where they're meant to amen <laughs> so i also wanted to ask you um uh because our our listeners probably don't know a lot about hasidut mm -hmm. um in a nutshell, would you be able to explain what Hasidut is? Sure. Um, I'm going to borrow in my definition from uh, Rabbi Professor Arthur Green, Art Green, um, mm -hmm. who I can't really help but quote him just because, like, his quotations from his books are like imprinted on my source sheets that I that I teach <laughs> from, and is I just think he does the best job of defining a lot of things very well so uh i'm not going to quote him exactly but you know i'm definitely uh definitely some of his terms there so um Chassidu is a religious revival movement um what does that mean it means basically a lot of people were jewish and they were finding that judaism was not very fulfilling not very fun not very meaningful they were just slapping through it they were just like getting through it and barely they were barely hanging on to it and it was a very very hard time it, it sprang up really i i would say like the birth of Hasidur is probably like 1740 give or take a little but that's probably like you know ground zero for the movement and it was um it was in part of the world really uh that today we would call ukraine and and uh it soon spread w within a couple of generations in very uh strong force to Poland as well, but really it starts in Ukraine and Galicia um, and with the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the movement, really a kind of accidental founder in some ways. Um, the Baal Shem Tov is a healer, a shaman. He travels around helping people. He really is the kind of person that if you interact with him even just for a few moments once, it might be like a, one of the most memorable moments of your life. You know, he, he says things to people. He also gives them healing herbs getting amulets, um, but he becomes more and more famous for his teachings being consciousness shifting teachings that he says things to people that just change the way they look at life. It changes the way they look at Torah because his teachings are based on Torah. His teachings are essentially a deeper form of Torah than what's come before. It's essentially taking very, very deep ideas from within Kabbalah, from Jewish mysticism, and just bringing them to a very, very down-to-earth place where people who are not so highly educated and who are living a very physical day-to-day -day life just trying to you know survive and feed themselves and their families and so on and you know just really living in the very material world he brings these very like highfalutin spiritual ideas right down to a place where not only can they understand it but they realize that they can live it and apply it uh, so you know just just like on the most basic level everything we do with our bodies everything physical that we engage with all the time speaking with other people and cleaning things and cooking things and eating things and all of our relationships and all of everything we do down here it's all holy it's all sacred in that it all has the ability the potential to be holy and sacred and and we can uplift it if we do it in the best way in the, in the most skillful way um and this terrified the kind of like Jewish establishment, the religious establishments, you know, the network, um, or not even such a network, but a very loose network um, of existing Jewish rabbinic leaders, rabbis, synagogues, institutions of all kind, because they saw a very threatening uh, wave of populism, and and they and they were also worried that it was heretical, which it wasn't really at all. But to, for, it's understandable how they thought it was. Um, and uh, it basically caused a lot of controversy. And you know, the, the Hasidim, it's hard to imagine now because Hasidism now is part of what we call ultra-Orthodox Judaism, ultra-Orthodoxy, which is you know the people who claim to be the most kind of strict and the most faithful adherents to Judaism and who, who dress all in the same way that people used to 200 years ago. And you know, trying their kind of slogan is like, nothing changes, we keep everything the same. 
But Hasidism was a big, big, big revolution, a big change, so much so that they were excommunicated very strongly by their opponents. So, and you know, it was not not a laughing matter. Excommunication meant that you couldn't talk to them, you couldn't do business with them, you couldn't that your children couldn't have anything to do with them. Definitely you you definitely couldn't like marry someone from them, their families and stuff like that. So like you know, they were essentially called not Jewish. They were essentially like cast outside of Judaism altogether. Um, and it's a fascinating story of radicalism um, that eventually was kind of tempered because eventually it kind of like came back within the fray, as I said, like to the point where now we have this thing called ultra-Orthodoxy. It's very, very conservative Judaism, with conservative with a small c, um, which uh, includes Hasidic Judaism. So it's... Um, it's yeah, it's just like a fascinating story. And what what I'm all about, what I try and do when I teach, is to take the ideas, especially from the very first few generations where things were the most radical and universalistic in some ways, uh, and try and see what these ideas have to say to us right now, today, in where in the place and time and situation where we find ourselves. And uh, a lot of these ideas are very powerful healing a lot of them are medicine um and it's not a coincidence that he said the Baal Shem Tov was a healer so you know a lot of what him and his students are are giving over is, is obviously and directly healing a lot of it is very psychologically insightful profoundly so um a lot of it really helps people you know just just yesterday I had the privilege of sitting with about 20 25 people on zoom and uh, we discussed the meaning of the new month that we just started, the month of Vedar, uh, according to many Hasidic teachings. Um, and people shared from very deep and vulnerable and beautiful places about how it related to their lives and their experience. And they added their own commentaries and insights and questions. And um, it was it was very healing. You know, we, it was it was like a collective healing experience. So um, that's really why I'm into it. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm glad you brought up Adar. Um, the month of Adar, uh, for those who don't know, um, is is one of our Jewish months. It's connected with um, the Zodiac Pisces. And it's also connected with like Yosef, Joseph from the Bible. Um, it's very much so high high levels of, of, of spiritual, uh, spiritual, like dream work, um, different, different things within the divine flow. And, um, so I would love to hear, um, uh, more from your perspective of Adar of like, even, like what how are you connecting with adar this particular year good question um uh, so the the talmud says uh from the time that we enter adar we increase in joy um and it's pretty clear from a lot of our texts and also just from real life and experiences this is not a joy an easy joy of uh happiness because everything's going well and is easy in fact it does a very complicated time things often are not easy and and uh even many tragedies have befallen us in the dark um including by the way you know the almost tragedy of purim the festival of adar that happens at the full moon uh that you know really at the, the climax of the energy of the month um you know we um, we might think of purim as like a kids festival where we we just like eat drink and be merry and dress up and dance and get drunk or whatever but actually you know the festival also includes a fast day that's very serious the reason we're fasting is because uh, according to the story at the festival there is a threat of annihilation hanging over the jewish people that every single jew in the whole world men, women, children, everyone, 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 were going to be killed. Um, so I want to say that the kind of joy associated with Adar is a very complex and double-edged thing. And we, we also see this um, in the Zohar. It talks about uh, the letter Kuf. Kuf is uh, the letter that's associated with the month. 
according to uh, Sefi Yasira, all this mystical mm -hmm. text. And uh, Kuf is the letter that goes down further than any other letter in, in the alphabet, in the Hebrew alphabet. It goes way down under the line, uh, like no other letter does. Um, and the Zohar, our mystical text, talks about how Kuf is connected to evil and the nether regions, you know, things things which are real bad. Um, and, of course, Kuf is also the first letter of the word Kadosh and many other wonderful, good, positive words and associations. So the the kind of lesson, and this is really, you know, your question was what's going on for me right now. This is really what's going on for me. Like, I'm finding this to be a time of, um, like, very extreme work of turning very difficult challenges into positive things. And, and you know, this also relates to Purim. That one of the main themes of Purim is that it says that the attempt to annihilate the Jewish people was flipped 180 degrees on its head. It was flipped on its head. I and mean, this is one of the key like quotations from the story, the Megillah that we actually sing, we turn into a song, um, it's one of the main themes of the festival that, you know, sometimes when you look at the world, you think things are going one way, and then suddenly, you know, the Berlin Wall just comes tumbling down overnight, and everyone's like, what just happened? And then the Soviet Union falls, and all these countries springing up as independent, sometimes democratic states that used to be part of the Soviet Union, and then, you know, I guess 30 years later, the Arab Spring happens, didn't end up so good mostly in the long run but at the time it was still like a big change and you know just i'm just giving examples from geopolitics but the point is that things which seem to be set in stone and seem to be never changing that that's actually an illusion like according to judaism especially jewish mysticism the world is always coming into being in every moment uh, and that means that everything has potential for change in every moment you know, you know and this this really resonates with me in terms of like the cells in our body but the, you know, people didn't used to know this, but now we know the cells in our body have a lifespan. They're constantly dying and being recreated, which means we are, we are not made up of the same cells that we used to be made up of. You know, we are literally different on cellular level. Um, so, you know, as well as neuroplasticity, there's just like spirit plasticity. Like, you know, we, we are able to change all the time. And, you know, because of that ability to change, we have the ability to take very, very hard things that feel like they're overwhelming and we might be stuck in them, which everyone experiences all the time, and actually somehow to come through it, right? To come, you know, to transform bad into good. And, you know, that's um, what I'm I'm seeing that happen in my own life right now. Not, not, that, not that it's, like, always happening <laughs> successfully, but I'm seeing, like, that's, like, the... Uh, the struggle going on for me and those around me, um, all kinds of challenges on on a kind of uh, relationship level and health level and the political situation in the country, which we probably shouldn't get too much into. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of really serious challenges, and um, you know, please God will be successful this Adar and generally in in flipping them, you know, from challenge to opportunity. Amen. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, in one of the previous podcasts, uh, I was speaking to um, Carmela Watts, and um, <clears throat> she doesn't know much about what's going on in this area of the world. And pretty much whatever I tell her is, you know, like, <laughs> like I'm her point of contact. And um, we were kind of talking about this shift from Aquarius season into Pisces, aka Shavat um into adar and it's it's interesting because um we were seeing like the country shift and change and part of the aquarian energy is literally shifting things on behalf of the highest and best and then we see like like on the flip side after those shifts and changes are happening right um like a different aspects of like this upside down you know turning the, the you know something upside down and seeing it from a completely different perspective you know like almost like if we're looking over the planet from you know as ether you know it's it's really an interesting concept 
Um, because when we allow ourselves to to go there and and allow ourselves to elevate, you know, asking Hashem to, you know, create holiness in our life, then that's when we start to shift everything. And, and I feel like that's, you know, where we start to increase in joy because we're, we're actually deepening our connection with Hashem, you know? You put that so beautifully. I mean, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. I mean, and really that that's true. But all of our festivals and all of our months have their own energy and their own mm -hmm. opportunities and challenges. And all of them are actually challenging us and giving us the opportunity to connect more with the infinite mystery of the universe in the unique circumstances, in the in the in the new state that each month offers us. So yeah, this month is is yeah. as you very say very well, like very much an opportunity to do that. And specifically with the challenges of I would say hiddenness. You know, a lot of this month is about yeah. illusion, delusion, hiddenness, disguise. It's one of the major themes that, you know, in the Purim story, God is totally absent and hidden in any, you know, God is not mentioned in the story in the Megillah. Uh, and everything seems to be happenstance. Um, and yet, you know, if we choose to, and it's it's really a very active choice. It's not like It's not like, oh, I either do or I don't. It's like, if you choose to, you can choose to see the infinite mystery of the universe as a oneness which is connected to all things um and therefore it's present even in stuff that seems to be profane or secular or challenging in whatever way it's challenging and this is actually really um one of the key messages of chassidu you asked about before the chassidic wisdom that I, I think is so important for us today is that it i think a lot of people compartmentalize and say you know like this stuff is good and this stuff is bad. This stuff is holy. This stuff is profane. This stuff, you know, I'm uncomfortable with my self image, my relationship with myself or others, you know, as long as it like ticks these boxes, checks these boxes. But like, you know, there's certain stuff about myself that I don't even want to go near. I won't even like open up that box. And, you know, I, I'm just like, there's too much repression or shame or whatever. And, you know, everybody has some element of that going on. But mm -hmm. the message of our wisdom is actually oneness means oneness and and actually integration uh is you know the healthy direction for all life and that's you know what we're what we're uh you know trying to evolve with really is you know that that direction of integration and adar is a really important step on the way because it's the final month of the months of the year according to the torah we have many new years in judaism but the next month nisan according to the torah is the first month and the liberation that we experience in the next month of Pesach or Passover is actually, you know, I would say probably like the most important thing probably that happens in our whole calendar spiritually, you know, at least potentially. I think, again, according to the Torah itself, it's the biggest deal. But it's only going to be an effective window for us into deeper liberation. We're only going to have a meaningful Pesach of actually feeling more free on a deep level if we like go on the journey, catch the wave uh, and like prepare for it in a meaningful way. And Purim and this whole month of Adar is essentially how um, Judaism thinks we need to prepare for Pesach. You know, that's a bit, big part of what's going on. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I started seeing things like, you know, in my mind's eye, essentially. Um, uh, in in astrology, you you have like, you have the sun that like, it would be in Pisces season, right? Um, but the Earth is 180 degrees away from the Sun, so that means it would be in Virgo, which means like Virgo season is Elul, which is also the last month before we go into a new year, Rosh Hashanah. And so, whatever we're doing during this time, we're actually even planting seeds um for what's going on six months from now which is really interesting yeah you hit the nail on the head basically the way the jewish calendar works is like that we're we're always um planting seeds which are going to be um enjoyed the fruits of which we're going to be enjoying later and we're also simultaneously always enjoying the fruits we planted previously there's this amazing cycle of okay. essentially like conception and birth or planting and, and reaping 
uh, going on like just yeah constantly all the time and it's all like overlapping and, and nourishing and all of the stories of the festivals and how they fit together all kind of like complement this and like add all these layers of meaning to it wow i love that thank you <laughs> oh wow um oh, i w i wanted to ask you what is one of your favorite teachings um in Kasi dude? Oh, okay. Let me. <laughs> it's like too many to even begin. Um, <laughs> well, let me let me just think. What's uh, what's on my heart right now? You know, I I I don't. I can't like narrow it down from you know from everything. But um, two things come to mind. Actually, no, no. Okay, this this is coming. This is coming. Good. Okay. There, there's a story that the Baal Shem Tov told a lot. A parable it's a very very common like format that he used a lot a lot of rabbinic texts use a lot as well um and it's a story of an apprentice to a blacksmith or a goldsmith depending on the versions of the story we have many different versions of it so this, this person is apprenticing let's say to learn how to be a blacksmith and they watch everything that their master does the blacksmith does this does that does this does that and they write everything down and they have a piece of paper that says you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that. And if you follow all these steps, then you successfully make whatever the product is that needs to be made at the end of the process. And the apprentice is called before the king in some versions of the story and asked to show uh, what he's learned. And if he's able to step up and begin to be, you know, the real deal, a master on his own who can actually, you know, make the thing on his own. And and so he goes through all the steps on his piece of paper and nothing happens. And then the Baal Shem Tov says it's because he didn't begin from actually having a real spark and a real fire and a real flame. So obviously nothing happened. And he said, and, uh, you know, this is obviously um, how it is with Judaism. And, you know, I'll add, you know, for all religions and for all human activities that, you know, if people do it with, genuine passion and investment enthusiasm presence then the fruits will testify to that and if not then you know very nice but it, it just isn't really alive and just really doesn't go anywhere and uh, that's really uh you know one of the key messages that Baal Shem Tov came to say to say you can go down your little list you know and he was really referring to rabbinic judaism and its codes of law that tells you exactly what to do and how to do and when to do it but, and, and, you know, he, he was very into, in Hasidism generally, was very into keeping the laws. It wasn't into breaking the laws. But he was just saying, if all you're doing is keeping the laws for the sake of it without the passion, then, you know, have fun. But it's, it's not, you're just like, you know, you're just acting, really. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I remember you sharing this in our class last year. Hmm. And, um, you know, I, I actually haven't... Um, heard a lot of the teachings of the Belshim Tov since then. So uh, I feel like you're you're activating a spark in my heart right now. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> happy, um, happy to do that. Thank you. Um, speaking of um, activating sparks, um, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, your music and poetry. Sure. Um, like, 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 uh, in general, I should, I should tell you the whole story, or do you have something specific you want to ask me about it? Um, whatever flows through you. Sure. Okay. Let me, uh, let me say, uh, I started, um, writing lyrics really at exactly the same time that I stopped practicing, uh, Jewish. Uh, observance, you know, I mentioned before when I was uh, uh, in college and undergrad. Um, and so it, I wouldn't have used this word consciously at the time, but it was really like I was writing my own liturgy, um, of my own, you know, which because I had kind of rejected my relationship with the traditional one. Um, and so a lot of what I write is, uh, it has that, that's its kind of primary um, purpose is for me to discover like what's going on inside and what i need and what, what you know to really try and access the wisdom within me um and um there's there's been a need to share it uh for a long time also which i've 
uh, investigated a lot. And you know, as I've grown, the need to share has become less kind of like about um, needing to uh, receive affirmation for it, and you know, kind of receive validation for it. And it's become more about um, really wanting there to be like a deep conversation going on where you know what I feel the need to write and and say and uh, put out there is, is like part of that conversation and that you know I hope that there's uh, other pieces <laughs> there's other people contributing to that conversation too uh, so that's um, that's kind of where I'm at with it at the moment yeah that's really cool. Is there a place where we can listen to your music? Uh, yeah, Spotify. Uh, my, my artist name is Danny Raphael and YouTube, Danny Raphael and uh, SoundCloud, if anyone still uses that. I still use that. <laughs> Good. I, I like it. I, I, I really don't know what's, uh, what's popping these days, but I like it. <laughs> oh, wow. I think the main two, uh, main three, I would say, is probably Apple Music, Spotify, and YouTube. Right. You know what? I forgot to say Apple Music. So um, that too, yeah. I uh, I kind of don't engage with it very much, but it's there. That's very awesome. I um, I I, I listened to one of your songs that you put out I, I, in Hanukkah. Yeah, it was during Hanukkah. Um, and I would love to listen to more. <laughs> sure, well, you know, no rush, but uh, you know where to find it. I'm um, I'm happy to say I'm I'm like fairly actively trying to like keep that creative muscle alive at the moment. Um, I'm not producing things at a fast rate, but I'm just I'm just trying to be like in the process. Uh, so you know, there's there'll be more stuff coming soon, hopefully. I love that. You know, I, I that's the thing with art is to being is is being able to like to cultivate it right and and allow it to come through you the way it wants to flow rather than like like pushing it and i can relate you know with my art i've had moments where i'm like i'm gonna do this and i'm like it's not time yet right we're still yeah we're still processing this <laughs> that, yeah I, that really resonates with me we um we let it come through us you know and ultimately we serve it you know we we are we are just the vessels so Amen. we uh we can't force anything and uh, you know we, of course when we try we learn that because you know when we try and do that it doesn't really come out so good um so you know we uh, gradually gradually we learn to let go hopefully Amen. Amen. well i want to i want to say thank you so much for coming on energy speaks um it's just such a, a an honor to have you here and um i was wondering would you like to any last words well thank you that went very very fast i guess that's a good time we were just having fun um <laughs> and, uh, you know really thanks for the invitation and it was lovely lovely to chat with you as i knew it would be and uh i'll just say i, I hope well, we get the chance to talk and learn again soon please god amen Amen. I thank you. And um, I thank you listeners for listening. Uh, this is Energy Speaks podcast with your host, Katriel. Have a beautiful, blessed Shabbat.